my wife was very much against uh, me stating this policy because she said, what if you're ever forced to give someone an A minus, that person will feel really bad. But uh, I'm going to give you, assign you some homework which will be graded. I think that uh, with these numbers I'll, I'll uh, look at it myself. And uh, if you need any kind of hints or anything, just tell me in class, so I'll, I'll, I'll help you go through it. The point of that is that there are some things which are better done by yourself. And uh, that's the best way, especially in representation theory, that's the way to, to, uh, to learn things, is to do quite a few computations by yourself. And now, uh, <laughs> Let me give you again so the framework and then I'll put the plan. So the, the framework of the course is a, was the following, which we stated in the first lesson. One was that uh, the structure of low dimensional space Uh, gives the most useful algebraic laws with QFT, quantum field theory, as a dictionary. And uh, you have seen that we have found just from the structure of a segment, for instance, the uh, uh, the uh, Dirac brackets. But we, I also showed you how to find uh, out of the structure of three-dimensional self itself, three-dimensional space itself, how to find uh, the structure of a Hopf algebra with all the axioms up to the last comma, weak Hopf algebra. And of course, we, uh, we try to do it here. We try to find the structure not for, uh, not for empty three-dimensional space, but for full four-dimensional space, which is two dimensions higher. So, uh, and the, the second part was to fill, fill uh, these laws or space. with uh, examples, with uh, examples, rich examples actually, based on symmetry. And this symmetry is going to be physically interpreted as the internal symmetry of matter. So we have to put matter into our model. And that's what we'll do today. Now, however, I would start with the part one, just uh, in order not to forget a bit the structure. So uh, I'm going to make a little computation, uh, extremely elementary, out of which, uh, amazingly, the Feynman diagrams pop up. So um, you see, when you do uh, something like uh, in the first grade, if you, if you have an operation, think of it like this, two plus three. So you can either use a graph or is dual. So two plus three gives you five, yes? Now, um, if you think of it this way, then if you take, let's say, A plus B plus C gives you D. Depends a bit on the orientation. So this one has an exit. So A plus B plus C equals D. Then you can put parentheses in two different ways. You can first compute A plus B with this triangulation. 
uh, or you can first compute b plus c. Yes? So if you notice, uh, this is just a way to write in a line uh, something that happens in two-dimensional space. 2D space. And notice also how we do the actual change of triangulation. We simply have a triangulation here. We imagine it as a surface filled with operations. And if we want to change triangulation, we put here the simplex delta 3, which is exactly this one. So we go from one face of it to another. Yes? On one side, we get one triangulation, on the other, the other. Yes? So all the operations are of this kind, which are a bit like uh, cohomology. Homology, cohomology in simplicial math. Now, uh, you see, if you have now a surface which is triangulated, it's going to, because of this, you're going to change the triangulation until you, uh, you, you can change the edges. So all that you will remain with are the vertices, yes? And our uh, model will be actually some vertices. We'll have different kinds of vertices. That's what we'll discuss today. So these are vertices. The triangulation doesn't matter because you can change the edges. You can change the edges, yes? So you can think of these as, as something surrounded by addition, by a flow of addition like a river around some, uh, around some posts, yes? And uh, I just wanted to draw your attention up upon our goal, so if we go in uh, two dimensions higher, then we have here a delta, uh, not a delta 3, but a delta 5. Yes. Here, where? This? Yes, yes. So, so you see, in the triangle to the right, we have this operation. Let's say 2 plus, uh, two plus 3 plus 4 gives you 9. Oh, yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, yes. And you can see, actually, that's an important part of our symmetry. Uh, the arrow could go the other way. And can you see what, uh, what happens in this case? Fast. Hmm? The sum of them is zero, exactly. So this is 2 plus 3 plus negative 5 is equal to uh, zero. Uh, yes, the, uh, um, the idea here is that the data lives on the boundary of the simplex. Yes? Once you fill it, then the data contracts. Yes? And the data here would contract to a point. Now here, you, can sub, you have subdivided the boundary in two, and you're deforming one half of it into the other one. Yes? So you can look at the same thing in very many different ways, which are exactly the ways in which you look at a triangle. Yes, so our math, uh, our associativity, translates simply a, a property of two-dimensional uh, space. And uh, now if you do the same with delta 5, yes, you have here th delta 5, you can imagine it as a, uh, as a hexagon with all the lines drawn. Yes, that's how at least a one-dimensional skeleton of it looks like. So let's call the vertices 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And, uh, and you have three of them, three delta 4s on one side and three delta 4s on the other side. Yes? 
The theory has an even and odd, so uh, things behave differently depending on the parity of the, of the number of dimensions. And assume that we can, we can uh, uh, switch triangulation between these two. And the question is, what plays a role in the punctures? Which parts remain unchanged? So the simplest is here. You see the faces of this, uh, uh, this uh, five-dimensional simplex are obtained by skipping a vertex. You see this is a four-dimensional simplex, which is the part of the boundary, right? So the uh, faces, so co-dimension one faces, are uh, skip zero, skip one, up to skip five. Yes? And they certainly change from one side to another, just like the triangles. So this side, let's say, is skip zero, union with skip one, union with skip two, and this one is skip three, union with skip four, union with skip five, this half. Right. And uh, if we make the change of triangulation, then obviously these faces are only on one side. Now the co-dimension two faces would be something like skip zero and one. Yes, which is a face with vertices uh, two, three, four, five. Yes. So that is a 3D simplex, two, three, four, five. You recognize it, and uh, and so on. And again, they're all different. Co-dimension three faces are uh, things like zero, one, two. You see, which is a face with vertices three, four, five. This one is only in this, but it, it's not in either of these, because it, uh, so it's, it's only on the right hand side, skip 0, 1, 2 is only here, yes, because it certainly does not skip 3, right? It doesn't skip the others. So the first ones which are in both are the co-dimension 4 faces, which are something like 0, 1, 2, 3, which is a face uh, Four, five, yes, and this face is in skip. Uh, is certainly in skip zero and is in skip uh, mm, three. Uh, is, so it's on both sides. Yes. So these are on both sides. And so the one skeleton this is a one dimensional thing, it's the edge four five. Yes? So the one dimensional skeleton is in both. You may change triangulation but you cannot change the one-dimensional skeleton, and you are very familiar with one-dimensional uh, things in four-dimensional space. Yes, they are. Yes? What's that? World lines, exactly, world lines of particles, yes? So this, these are exactly our punctures in the plane, Yes, so they are word lines of particles. So this is 1D. So this means that you may use, uh, this means that you may use uh, uh, triangulations just to compute things. But in, this, in the model we're aiming at, 
you would have uh, lifelines of particles which will be surrounded by four-dimensional computations. Yes, exactly like here, you had punctures which were surrounded by by addition here, the, the, uh, because you have a Hopf algebraized data, the typical richest uh, thing you can put here are uh, group representations, representations of uh, simple E groups. Yes, and uh, we'll do that. But we'll do also the higher, higher dimensional variants. That's what uh, counterparts, th this is what, what we'll do in this course. So we'll show that all the usual uh, things that you learned about maybe in, uh, in the representation theory like uh, um, roots, weights, uh, um, actual representations, uh, Gelfand, Settling, and or explicit representation matrices even, all of these have, uh, have higher dimensional counterparts which work and they... Okay, but uh, now, are there any questions about this part? So this was just this is just a context. Once you have such a context, you need to fill it. So you need to fill it with some actual symmetry, and that's what we're going to do. Sorry? More things. Oh, more than the dimension, yes. Actually, as you can see here, the, the, uh, the lifelines, it's a, it's a great question. The lifelines, uh, I mean, the, the part that remains unchanged grows with half the dimension, if you noticed. It was zero dimensional out of two, and it was one dimensional out of four. The next one, exactly the same uh, thinking, gives you a model which is six dimensional, and we, in which lifelines are two-dimensional. And there is such a model in quantum field theory, surfaces in uh, six dimensions, is considered very mysterious, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a model uh, based on, I think, su supersymmetry in, uh, uh, in six dimensions, uh, where the lifelines of particles are replaced with surfaces. So... Uh, Yes, yes, we have to uh, we have to make some math which fills them with computations. Yes, so the idea is that on the faces you have vector spaces, and in the middle of them you have computations. Yes, but we're going to start now very uh, very slowly with a uh, with actually some finite graphs. Yes, so so. You, you see, there are two parts. This, this is a part that I emphasize there. One is to find what laws you have. Uh, so let's say that you found the structure of a group. Yes, This doesn't give you groups. There were two uh, mechanisms which produced groups from the very beginning. Evaris Galois found them as uh, symmetry of roots of polynomials. And uh, then Poincaré found them topologically as a fundamental group of manifolds. Yes, so we have to uh, have a mechanism which gives us groups. Just having the law is not enough. Well, let's say even if you know the only group you know is E mod two, that that uh, is not good enough. You have to produce actual rich structures, and that's what I'm going to try right now to do uh, fast and direct, yes? We can... <laughs> so here's a, a, a list of uh, graphs. A n, n is a number of points. Dn is, 
E6. E7. And E8. So we're going to find a small, the idea is the following, find small graphs. Now, of course, you could take uh, graphs with very few edges, but it turns out that's not the right uh, notion. Uh, and the right notion is to... Uh, to take uh, something like this. Uh, what did you hear? Yes, yes, once again. Mathematically. Yes, yes. It's a what of a what? Uh, yes, but it's mathematically what? Uh, it's it's an eigenvalue, yes? So it's an eigenvalue of something like a Laplacian, right? Yes, that's what you hear. So uh, if you want to find small graphs, we need a stethoscope to uh, make them vibrate and, and listen to them. But before that, so we're going to make them into matrices. Uh, a matrix for AN, for instance, let's take uh, the A3, right, which is something like this, and we're going to interpret it in the following way, here as uh, having edges going both directions, that's just a matter of notation, and uh, we're going to write the adjacency matrix which is something like this, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 0, yes? These one ones are the edges from, uh, from one vertex to the next, yes? So the graph AN would have these, uh, so this is a graph AN would have ones uh, above, right above and right below the diagonal, right? And this is called in uh, group theory the Laplacian of the graph, delta of an. Now, the usual Laplacian in physics, you also subtract the average. But the average is here an irrational number, which we'll find right away. And uh, graph theorists decided not to have to deal with square roots or with strange numbers. So they just don't subtract the average. Yes? And uh, let's find uh, very fast for this graph the eigenvalues. Yes, so I'm going to just write, write them. This one times the following vector. One, uh, I think it's uh, one root two, if I'm not wrong. One root two and one, let's try it. You see, this would give you root 2, uh, 2, and root 2, yes? Which is equal to root 2 times 1, root 2, and 1, yes? So the first eigenvalue is root 2, and uh, second eigenvalue, uh, so it should have three of them, yes? The second eigenvalue should be... Uh, uh, for 1, 0, negative 1, yes, and uh, uh, for this one, the eigenvalue is 0, and uh, I'm going to let you find the third one as an exercise. Now, there is a theory which is part of uh, linear algebra, 
the requirement, but I would I would uh, show you uh, if you want what are the tricks to do it uh, by all by yourselves. It's a Peron Frobenius. theory, which states that if a matrix has non-negative entries, so if an n by n matrix, is irreducible in the sense that it is not equivalent to uh, something like, uh, like an upper triangular like upper triangular blocks via permutations. So if you cannot decompose it by permuting into, into two things like this, then it, uh, it has a unique, and if it's a n by n matrix with non-negative entries, and if it does not, uh, if it does not uh, uh, separate this way, then it has a unique non-negative eigenvector. Uh, it it can have some zeros. This this matrix is is actually okay as long as you cannot. Uh, decompose, put it, uh, put it in this form, yes? As long as you cannot, if you make it into a graph, as long as the graph is connected, yes? That's all that's required. The unique eigenvectors with entries bigger than or equal to zero, maybe it's written a bit small, and uh, uh, which is uh, here, is exactly our one root two and one. Yes, you notice that the other had some non-negative, had some negative eigenvalues. A unique, of course, in the sense of eigenvectors up to up to scaling, and uh, that gives a norm of the matrix. The matrix norm, the corresponding eigenvalue, and uh, all the other. eigenvectors have uh, so the other eigenvectors have eigenvalues lambda less so this one is uh, lambda a unique eigenvector with entries bigger than zero, so the eigenvalue lambda zero is a norm. And the other eigenvectors have lambda strictly, in module, strictly less than lambda zero. Yes, so all the other eigenvalues are smaller in module. Yes, so there's one dominant one, and once you found that, you found the norm of the matrix. Uh, I'm going to give some indications. Maybe we'll have a, uh, an assistant to this course who will do that with you. It's actually quite fun to try to do this by yourself. Yes. Uh, basically, you do all the usual inequalities. And so for vectors, for instance, if you have another vector, you can take the absolute value of every entry of it. Yes. Any questions? No, one, one negative, uh, let's see, it is, uh, so one negative root two, yes, let's, let's try, uh, yes, 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 actually, uh, maybe this, this matrix actually does separate into two, yes, yes. So you're, you're, uh, you're absolutely right. So let's see here, one negative root two and one, this would give you the negative, uh, the entry negative root two. Yes, wonderful. Yes, 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 yes. So let's see up to a permutation. This matrix is actually uh, is actually bipartite. So we should do it only for one side of it. 
You're absolutely right. So the matrix is bipartite, so we should do one direction only. But uh, still, what we're going to keep is the fact that, uh, that the highest eigenvalue gives us a norm. Yes, so we're going to find the eigenvalue and find the norm. Wonderful. So, uh, let's find the small graphs, and let me make now one more, one more list here. This would be the following. AN with one extra. So this is AN uh, affine. Tilde will put this stands for affine. DN. Fine. E six a fine. E7 are fine. And E8 are fine. Notice how they are set. E8 are fine. And some more, which are tadpoles. On one side or on both sides. For foreign students, uh, tadpoles are one of the stages of development of a frog. Yes. And uh, we we'll have to show in the theory that these don't appear. Now, uh, let's write the eigenvector, the Perron Frobenius eigenvector for, uh, for these uh, big ones. Uh, what should be this one? Can you figure out? Let's try it. One, 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 one. Yes. If you notice here, the eigenvalue lambda is two. Here it's one, one, two, 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 and one, one. Yes. E6 uh, fine is one, two, three, two, one, two, one. And this is one, two, three, four. Two, three, two, one, and this one is one, two, three, four, five, six, three, four, and two. Yes, this this is the uh, the Perron eigenvector eigenvector, which gives a norm. If you notice, the sum of neighbors, so what the Laplacian does is it takes the sum of neighbors, yes? So this is a vector V, and delta V at a point P is equal to the sum of all edges of V of Q. Yes, so it's a sum of neighbors. Uh, 
thanks for the question. So, so uh, do you see what happens here if you take the sum of neighbors? You get? Yes, yes. 1 plus 3 is 2 times 2, right? So these are exactly, the norm is exactly equal to 2, yes? As shown by these numbers. Yes? Now, uh, when we'll do the Lee uh, theory, we're going to use uh, two times the identity minus the matrix of uh, such a graph. And so it's very important whether the norm is equal to two or less than two and so on. So, so this norm is equal to two. Can you see uh, fast uh, people in number theory who look at various progressions? Uh, what's the rule here? What do you have on every leg? These numbers, 6, 3, 6, 4, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, yes. Oh, come on. It's an arithmetic progression, yes? And of course, in an arithmetic progression, the sum of the two neighbors is exactly twice the value at that point, right? And in order to work, it's an arithmetic progression which starts with what, which you don't see. It starts with zero, exactly. So it's an arithmetic progression which starts with zero so that uh, the, uh, here the, the condition holds as well, yes? So every leg arithmetic progression which starts with zero, yes? And here, these are also 2, 2, 2. Yes, they're constant here, and here they have 1. And this is 2, 2, 2, 2. And you notice that here you take the sum of this plus 1 through the loop, right? And uh, theorem. The only let's uh, let me call this uh, this uh, the list A and this let's say the list B. And now the statement is the uh, following: the uh, The only graphs, unoriented graphs, let's say, with norm of the Laplacian less than two are on list A. And the only, and the ones with norm of G equals to two, those are on the list B. So these are the only graphs with uh, norm less than uh, two and respectively equal to two, yes? And uh, uh, now you think that such a thing would be proved uh, in a very difficult manner, and if you take a, a book in representation theory, you'd find such a difficult manner to prove them. But it's actually, there's a one-line proof for this, namely, Proof. The proof comes from an observation. If you uh, put extra edges on a graph, 
then the norm of the graph increases because the original eigenvector will satisfy, let's say, it has eigenvalue root 3. Then if you add some uh, edges or even uh, some extra legs, you, you will ha find a vector which uh, is mapped into more than root 3 times itself. So th it, must, it means that there is some other eigenvector maybe which has norm bigger than that. And since the Peron Frobenius is the biggest, that. So the proof is the following. The only graphs not containing as a subgraph, a graph on list B. are on the list A. This will prove the first one. And the second part of the proof, maybe you can guess it, the only graphs. So again, the proof must be provided by the picture. The only graphs. So. What would prove that these are the only graphs of norm equal to 2? Any other strictly contains wonderful. So the only graphs not strictly containing A graph on list B are on the list B. Now, the proof of these two observations is the following. Well, let's see. Uh, what could happen to a graph? Can it contain a loop? If it has norm less than 2, it cannot contain a loop because it would contain A and tilde, yes? So uh, for 1, yes? No loop. Yes, else it, else it contains uh, A tilde. Yes? See that loop. 2, uh, no... Uh, Yes. Ah, and I, I should have put also the tadpole. The tadpole was, was very mysterious, and I'm afraid I, I should have added one. It's a very strange thing. It does not appear in, uh, in representation theory, and the reason will be shown in this course. I don't think it was... Uh, published before. So we have here also a tadpole. Yes? So, let's look uh, more at them. Two, if it has a triple point, what, what, uh, what happens then? From the list B. It's the only triple point, otherwise you'd have the D, yes? Else, it would contain the D tilde, yes? Uh, what about a quadruple point? Can somebody see why doesn't it have a quadruple point? The, exactly, wonderful, so three. This is the uh, uh, no quadruple point. Uh, 
else it contains this graph which is the uh, D4 tilde, yes, which is on the list. So if it has one, uh, one triple point, it cannot contain another, yes? And then the, the rest is, uh, okay, if it has similarly one triple point or one, let's put here, or one uh, tadpole, or one simple loop, yes, let's call it tadpole loop. Yes, then it cannot, uh, it cannot contain another one, again, by those. Yes, and finally, if it has one triple point, then it cannot have legs which are too, too long, yes? If it has, would have long, very long legs, it would be in one of the cases E6 affine, E7 affine, or E8 affine, yes? Then E six seven eight, yes? Because else it would have one of the E six affine. If it would have one very long leg, it would contain E eight tilde. Do you see? If it has two very long legs, it would contain E seven tilde. Yes. And if it has uh, uh, all three legs longer than two the two or longer, then it would contain a six tilde, yes? So the conclusion is that these are the only, the only small graphs. And the small uh, comes from uh, looking at the norm of the graph. Yes, that's the way the graph acts on vectors. And it's uh, quite uh, amazing how this theory translates, how the eigenvectors and the graphs translate into, uh, into the, the kind of mathematics which, uh, which you know, and this is exactly what, uh, what we are going to, uh, to look at. Uh, so let's find the actual, uh, the actual eigenvalues and eigenvectors for the ADE graphs because we're going to work with them all the time. And uh, um, before I, I don't want to do this in the last minute, what we're going to show uh, on Friday on, uh, is that uh, these graphs have amazing new symmetries. So the graph E8, for instance, has 32 uh, generalized symmetries. And the graph uh, E6 has 12. And uh, only two of them you can see for E6 with a naked eye, which are just the identity and the Z mod 2, switching the two legs. If you happen to know a representation theory that gives birth to multiple laced edges, uh, multiple laced graphs, the F graph, yes. Uh, also, another uh, thing here, if you notice among the first ones, so leaving the tadpoles uh, out, uh, if you notice that we have added a single vertex, right? This is a feature for, uh, for these graphs. We have added a single vertex to make them all of norm equal to two. Yes? And uh, actually, the... Uh, for instance, if you compute a graph, if you compute a, 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 league, a simple Lie group out of such a graph, out of the original graph, and you build, uh, you, you look at the order of the Weyl group, then it's a product of those numbers times a factorial, times some factorial of n, times the number of ones on this graph. So, so all it, a, each and every bit of it has a has a meaning. The place where the, the extra vertex connects to the graph, that's where you'll find the adjoint representation of the group. So all of the representation theory can be built out of these graphs. So what we're going to find is that these graphs, which were originally built for crystallographic region, reasons, just to encode the basis of, uh, 
of a crystallographic uh, lattice. And I, I'll tell you about it. I heard from the, the people uh, firsthand, the people who, uh, who actually named them, so from Duncan and, uh, and uh, Gelfand. Uh, uh, so uh, these graphs are actually have a life of their own. So what we're going to show is that there are some quantum subgroups of SU2 or some quantum symmetries of these graphs themselves. Which, uh, which give the vertices of such graphs. And they have a geometry, parallel transport, they have a whole structure. So each of these graphs has a life of its own. Yes, which we shall, and we'll show that all the representation theory, everything that you, you learn in a, in a book on representation theory can be done best in terms of the graph itself and of the subgroup. So in particular, uh, let me see, uh, yes, in particular, a, um, for instance, there's a dodecahedron. The symmetries of the dodecahedron are a subgroup of SU2. And uh, just looking at that, uh, you can build the most complicated Lie group of type E8. So that's what we'll do in the course. Now, let's go fast uh, in order to work with those in a modern language to uh, quantum uh, numbers. So here are, here are the quantum numbers, the first version of them. One is one, two is one plus Q, Q is a variable. Three is one plus Q plus Q star, Q square, yes. So these are uncentered. Lest you think that these are very modern things, just the terminology is modern, but Euler, was, uh, Euler figured out first that all kinds of computations that he was doing made sense uh, with these more more general numbers than uh, than just the usual ones, so uh, now let's compute fast. Uh, for instance, three factorial. So this is a product of these. So what would this be? One plus uh, two uh, q, right? Plus how many times q square? I think two q square, right? Plus q to the third. Yes, this is a factorial. So uh, uh, first of all, uh, I'll give you a, a geometric interpretation and a combinatorial one. These should be the permutations. Let's write the permutation as a line. Permutation one, two, three, one, three, two, uh, two, one, three, two, three, one. 3, 1, 2, and 3, 2, 1. Yes, and just heuristically, let's assign uh, which should be 1. 1, 2, 3. Uh, Q cube should be this one, 3, 2, 1. Yes, and the others should be, two of them should be Q and 2 R Q square. Can you see what does the power of Q measure? the number of inversions in the permutation, yes? So if you write here this one as, let's say, 2, 3, 1, this 2, 3, 1 is 1, 2, 3, which goes to 2, 3, 1, yes? And you can even draw it like this, yes? And the number of inversions is the number of intersections, so this will be Q square, yes? So uh, wonderful. So this is this is so they count a little bit more than just counting the permutations. Yes, and if you like uh, some uh, very very basic algebraic geometry, let's try to find the number of ways to find a find basis, find a basis in uh, let's say R three. So the number of ways in which you can, uh, this doesn't make any sense, right? So instead of that, let's take here the field with Q elements to the power three, yes? So uh, uh, the first vector in the basis should not be in the origin, right? 
you choose a basis in one q q square one q yes so this is one q q square so it's a field with q elements so uh, q is some prime number so this would be just the first vector uh, should be different from zero so you have how many possibilities q third minus one yes and for the second v2 should not be on the line of v1 so so you have q cube minus q yes and for the third one v3 similarly should not be in the plane of the first two so you have q q cube minus q square yes you take the product of all these and this is equal to the product yes is equal to uh, uh, q minus 1 cube times our uh, quantum 3 factorial there yes uh, what would you make out of uh, dividing by q minus 1 cube hmm? yes it's flags you 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 can rescale every vector individually yes rescale each of the lines yes so on each line you have q minus one non-zero element so you can multiply by any of them yes so this is rescale rescale each vi individually yes and what you get is exactly our quantum q so these are the, the interpretations yes and we're going to uh, work with these at some uh, uh, oh and we should uh, we should uh, do it next time uh, try to find by yourselves yes so that the uh, the graphs on the list a yes have all uh, the eigenvalue uh, quantum 2 at some root of unity yes and the next time I'll tell you a good uh, story about Kronecker who figured out the theorem. Well, actually I'll tell you the story in one second. He figured out the norms, but he didn't figure out the graphs because he probably didn't believe that it could be done. <laughs>